Welcome everyone to our Canadian Diabetes Association's National Fall Webinar Series. My name is Farah Ismail and I'm a Program Manager for the Canadian Diabetes Association and I will be your host for today. We are delighted that you're able to join us for the webinar on Diabetes Medications, What You Need to Know. Now to start off, I would like to draw your attention to the survey. It's located at the top right-hand section of your screen. In order to better serve your needs, we kindly ask that you provide us with your input by completing the short survey towards the end of the presentation. And we thank you in advance for your input. Throughout the presentation, you will have the opportunity to type in the question and answer box, which is located at the bottom right-hand section of your screen. We ask that you use this box for any questions you have along the way, and our presenter will be happy to answer them at the end of the presentation. As well, we will be displaying a few polling questions towards the end of the presentation and would love for your participation. It is important to note that the questions do remain anonymous. Also note that you are able to customize your screens, um, so you can expand and collapse them any way you please, and that's done by simply dragging down the bottom right-hand corner of each of the webinar pods. The presentation itself will last from 40 to 45 minutes, um, and then we'll do about 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A at the end. Uh, it's important to note that our presentations will be posted on our CDA website um, in a few weeks, as well as on our CDA YouTube channel. So now I'd like to welcome our speaker, Elaine Cook, and thank her for joining us today. But before I turn it over to Elaine, I'd like to give you a brief introduction. Elaine Cook is a pharmacist and a certified diabetes educator for British Columbia. She's the editor-in-chief of the Diabetes Communicator, a professional publication of the Canadian Diabetes Association. Elaine has authored many articles on diabetes for Family Health's Managing Diabetes magazine, and she's been a regular contributor to the Pharmacy Practice magazine's annual diabetes supplement. For more information on Elaine, please read the speaker bio section, which is to the left of your screen. So, without further ado, I present to you Elaine Cook. Good evening, everyone, or good afternoon if you're on the West Coast. So we're going to cover a uh, little bit just the differences, what is type 1 and type 2 diabetes, what causes the high blood sugar of type 2, and going over the medications used to treat type 2 diabetes, the oral medications, the injectable medications, and insulin, and then the end, just a little bit of information about hypoglycemia. So type 1 diabetes the ability of the body to produce insulin is destroyed. It's an autoimmune disease, and they need to start with insulin right away. Type 2 diabetes, there might be a lack of insulin or the inability of the insulin to actually work fully. It's called insulin resistance. I have been asked in the past, if I have type 2 and I go on insulin, am I now type 1? And no. It's just this is the designation. If you start with pills, you start with lifestyle, you have always got type 2, even if you, only, if you end up only being on insulin. And I'm going to say this a couple of times, but type 2 diabetes is a progressive disease. By the time that you are diagnosed with diabetes type 2, you've already lost 50% of the ability to produce insulin from your pancreas. And that continues to go along. And eventually, most people do require insulin in some form to control their blood sugar. So self-management, and you guys should all be familiar with this, you have to deal with your lifestyle. That's going to be a continual thing, whether you're on medications or not. And that does mean that you're making healthy food choices, looking at getting control of your weight, a healthy weight, and doing regular physical activity. You want to control your blood sugar. You also want to find out ways to use those numbers that you get from your blood glucose monitors to make changes with your diet and your exercise. It's important for you to find ways to deal with stress as that can increase your blood sugar, do problem-solving blood sugar and other issues. And if you're prescribed a medication, it's really important to take the medications as directed in order for you to get the full value for them. So as you probably all know, the targets for uh, getting control of your blood sugar is for you to aim for an A1C, that's that three-month lab test your doctor sends you for, of less than 
get your blood sugars before meals to be in that 4 to 7 millimoles per liter range. That's the number that appears on your meter. And to look at checking your blood sugar a little bit more often two hours after your meal because you don't just have diabetes first thing in the morning. And you're aiming for 5 to 10 on your blood glucose meter. Or if you're not at that A1C of 7% or less, then you're aiming for a target of 5.8, a 5 to 8, sorry. So where does that high blood sugar of diabetes come from? So many things in our bodies change that contribute to getting that blood, le the sugar level in the blood to being higher. And those of you that have been through diabetes education centers, first thing they'll talk to you about medications is that when you have diabetes, that your liver leaks out. A lot of times it's referred to as a leaky liver. It leaks out sugar or glucose is the other word that goes into your bloodstream. And especially overnight, this appears to happen. And it's one of the reasons why your first challenge is that your morning blood sugar often is starting to rise higher. Now, I already mentioned that the ability of the pancreas to produce insulin is less than someone without diabetes. And so less insulin means more sugar stays in the bloodstream, but there's not enough insulin to take it into your cells for it to work. There's another hormone that comes out of your pancreas. It's called glucagon and it causes your blood sugar to go up as well. In fact, it's a, sort of a mechanism opposite to insulin. And we're going to talk about why glucagon is important when we're talking about the medications. So there's an, another way when your body has that insulin resistance. It really means that insulin can't get a hold of the glucose and take it into your cells for it to be used, and that's called insulin resistance. And in our the amount of food that we're eating, and as often as you're getting more into diabetes, you lose the ability to tell when you're full. You often eat very much simple carbohydrates, so it increases your blood sugar that way. But when you eat, your intestines release a hormone called GLP-1. And GLP-1 is what helps to regulate the blood sugar in many ways, and that amount of that hormone is diminished in people that have type 2 diabetes. In the last year or so, we've really come to be aware that the kidney plays a very important role in increasing your blood sugar as well. So the kidney helps to uh, take blood sugar out of your um, urine back into your system, but we'll talk about that when we talk about the drugs. So medications that you're going to get, they're going to change all the time. Medications can be added and changed to gain and to keep control. It may be that you end up with four or five medications, and maybe you're a lucky person and two work for you, but it's all individualized. And the agents that are added, usually they add one that works on a different system in your body to help control that blood sugar based on that picture gram I just showed you. Almost every single oral medication lowers the A1C in that 1 to 1 per 0.5 percent. And we'll talk about some of those that are different. And as I've already said, diabetes is a progressive disorder. And because of that continued loss of the ability of the body to produce insulin, almost up to 60 percent of people that have type 2 diabetes will eventually require insulin in some form, even if it's just once a day at bedtime. So, how do medications work to deal with these changes that I've talked to you about? So that first thing, the liver throwing out more sugar into your bloodstream. The medication metformin primarily, insulin does it as well, and to a small extent, the drugs called rosiglitazone and pioglitazone. They slow down the release of sugar from the liver, so that causes your blood sugar levels to lower. And there's medications called Gliburide, glicoside, glomepramide, repaglinide, insulin, GLP-1 analogs, and DPP-4 inhibitors, all of which we're going to talk about. But those can have an effect on the pancreas to increase the amount of insulin that is secreted. And the last two, the GLP-1 and DPP-4, also suppress that glucagon. And the result of that, again, is that your blood sugar goes lower. There's medications that can affect that insulin resistance. Uh, rosiglitazone, pioglitazone, metformin, to a lesser degree, its main action, again, is in the liver. And, of course, insulin can look after this as well. By decreasing insulin resistance, more sugar will be taken into your cells, and it will lower your blood sugar. There's drugs that work on your stomach, a carbose, 
and there's the ones that work in the intestinal area, which is the GLP-1s and DPP-4s, and their action will lead to less sugar going into the bloodstream or more insulin looking after it, again, lowering the blood sugars. The new kid on the block is this kidney that, as I said a couple of years ago, the drugs that work there are the new class of drugs called GL, SGLT2 inhibitors. And because they change the amount of glucose that is excreted, it causes a lowering in blood sugar. And I'm going to talk about each of these individual medication classes one at a time. So the first medication that is usually prescribed for most everyone that has diabetes is a drug called metformin. Again, it works in the liver. It comes in regular tablets, and there is no long-acting form available called glumetza. And glumetza because of its long action, has less side effects. The primary action of metformin, as I've said, is to slow the release of sugar from the liver. And secondary, it does help the body use the insulin that it has. The, uh, you might almost want to take it with food, and the long-acting form is once a day, whereas the uh, regular tablets are often taken multiple times a day. Doses from 500 milligrams up to 200 and 2,550 milligrams. You could take as much as two at breakfast, one at lunch, and two at supper, and it is always taken with food. But if you're prescribed this, the doctor says, I want you to take this one, three times a day, your doctor and your pharmacist are going to tell you that you want to start with a low dose and build the dose up. Say you're prescribed three times a day, one a day for a week perhaps, or three or four days, until you get used to the, perhaps the nausea, the vomiting, the diarrhea it may occur and gradually increase that dose until the dose that you have been given. So upset stomach, nausea, diarrhea are the most common side effects with this medication. And it does not by itself cause hypoglycemia. Because this drug is such a frequent one, I have a lot of people who believe that if they take the metformin tablet, it drops their blood sugar. But it doesn't. It just prevents more sugar from going into your bloodstream. By itself, it cannot cause a low blood sugar. If you're sick, you're vomiting, have diarrhea, unable to drink, basically you're not able to take in fluids, so you're at risk of dehydration, you should stop metformin until you feel better and check your blood sugar more often. Attached to this webinar, there is a number of resources at the bottom that Farrah will tell you where there are. And all of those, of those resources, there's a sick day list, and that talks about stopping metformin or other medications. And you can take that list to your doctor and have them discuss which medications you should stop if you get sick. Metformin is usually stopped four to eight hours before surgery, and if you're having any x-rays using radioactive dyes, and that's because it has an effect on the kidney, and so does the uh, x-rays. If your kidney function gets lowered, uh, often they'll, slower the, they'll lessen the dose that you're taking, or they'll discontinue it depending on how bad your kidney function is. Form it takes about two weeks to work. You can primarily tell that it's working by a decrease in your fasting blood sugar, your morning blood sugar. The next class of medications that we're going to talk about, they're called sulfonylureas, and they're the ones that work in the pancreas. I use an analogy with patients when I'm explaining this. It's like the sulfonylurea drugs work like squeezing a sponge, as if your pancreas was a sponge, to release more insulin. That's its main action. It stimulates the release of action from the pancreas. It should be taken at or just before the meal. Glyburide is one of the most common ones of this, 2.5 to 20 milligrams, once to twice daily. Glycoside, also known as diamicron, it comes in a regular tablet, dosed up to 320 milligrams once a day or in divided doses. It has a long-acting form, and it's 30 to 120 milligrams once a day in the morning, although I do see a lot of times this medication is prescribed twice a day. Its recommendation is that dose all be taken at one time in the morning. There's glomepramide. Don't see a lot of that prescribed. It's also called Amaryl. The dose is once a day for sure, one to eight milligrams. The, oops, I think I lost it. Oh, we're just going to go back. Sorry, quick fingers. The sulfonylurea medications. Let's see if we never, you have to make sure that you're regularly eating carbohydrate-containing food at your regular intervals. 
the carbohydrate containing food is essentially all your grains, all your fruits, all your vegetables, and you need to make sure that you're eating that so that you don't have a low blood sugar. So if you just eat protein and avoid all the carbohydrates, you are at risk of having a low blood sugar if you're on a sulfonylurea. The side effects primarily are that low blood sugar, hypoglycemia, and again, the causes can be less food than normal, more exercise than normal, and this medication can also cause weight gain. The glycoside or diamicron product with the glimepramide, because they're more sensitive to how they act based on what your blood sugar is, they do not cause as much hypoglycemia as glyburide. This drug is also one that if you are sick, vomiting, have diarrhea, or unable to drink, so you're at risk of dehydration, these are the medications also that you would stop until you're better and check your blood sugar more often. Another class of medications are called metaglitinides, and they're very similar to the sulfonylureas. They're also called non-sulfonylureas, secreted gods. So the drugs, there's two of them. Repaglinide, known as gluconorm, is taken before each meal, so either 0.5 or up to 4 milligrams. It's titrated based on the size of the meal and the action and your blood sugar later. The tiglinide, also known as Starlix, again, it's before meal, 60 to 120 milligrams. They stimulate very short-term release of insulin based on what your blood sugar is. So again, cause less low blood sugars than do the sulfonylurea drugs because it does matter what your blood sugar is. They have a very rapid onset. They start working quickly. They're peak in an hour, and the duration is a maximum of four hours. The dose should be taken at or up to 15 minutes before a meal. And again, the number that you take, your doctor is going to tell you, is based on what blood sugar you get two hours later or the size of your meal. And these medications are often used for people that have very irregular meal times because you're not tied into the action like you are with the sulfonylurea drugs. The side effects of this medication are very similar. Uh, hypoglycemia, but less than sulfonylurea, and also can cause weight gain. And again, if you're sick, you're vomiting, have diarrhea, unable to drink, or at risk of dehydration, these are also a medication that you need to stop until you're better and check your blood sugar more often. The action of these drugs primarily affects your after-meal blood sugar because that's when it's working. And some people refer to it almost like a short-acting oral insulin, although it's not oral insulin. And it reduces that sugar peak by about 3.3 millimoles. The A1C reduction, repaglinide is standard, about the 1%, but the ride really doesn't have as much of an action. It's only a half a percent. So the other next class of drugs called alpha-glucosidase inhibitor. The only drug, there's only one drug in this class. It's called a carbose or glucobay. And it's taken 25 to 100 milligrams in a divided dose, usually once or twice a day. It slows down how fast the carbohydrate is absorbed. It doesn't block carbohydrate absorption, but it's much slower, allowing the rise in blood sugar to be slower so that the insulin that you do have in your body can better uh, handle that rise as it's slower. It's taken with the first bite of the meal. The dose should be increased slowly, perhaps start with just 25 milligrams once a day. And the dose is usually changed about every two to eight weeks if it needs to be increased. Because the side effects of this medication are your stomach. It's gastrointestinal. Getting a lot of gas or flatulence, abdominal discomfort, and the upset stomach and that does not go away by taking an antacid tablet, for instance. By itself, this drug cannot cause hypoglycemia. But if you happen to be on another medication along with it that could cause hypoglycemia, like the sulfonylurea medications, then if you get a low, it's very important to use a dextrose tablet to treat that low blood sugar because taking orange juice or pop or honey, those are all carbohydrates and their absorption would be slower. So it's important to use dextrose tablets to treat that. It reduces your after-meal blood sugar by about 2.8 millimoles per liter. The next class of medications is known as diazolidinediones or TZDs. 
The two drugs that we see in Canada are rosiglitazone or Avandia or pioglitazone, which is Actos. However, these medications are very rarely prescribed anymore to someone who's just starting out. They may be used by someone who's been on them for a long time. So these medications, they work on that insulin resistance, that they allow your insulin to work, they allow your insulin to go into your cells and take the sugar in to feed them. The secondary action of them is it does help to slow down that release of sugar from the liver. Again, by these cells, these medications cannot cause hypoglycemia. So if they're taken with other medications that can, yes, it, you would think that you're having a low blood sugar. By themselves, they do not cause it. It doesn't matter when it's taken. It could be taken with food, without food. One of the challenges when people started these medications is they took 3 to 12 weeks to start working. The side effects were upper respiratory tract infection, fluid retention, heart failure, wrist fractures. These are the drugs that were talked about many years ago in a drug class that may cause an increase in heart problems or heart attacks. But those studies have been re-looked at in the States, and they've been interpreted in a different way. And really, in the States, they're starting to use this medication again. In Canada, because of that study that had happened, they no longer prescribe it on a very rare case. Perhaps your endocrinologist would put you on it. Increases that morning blood sugar from about 2.2 to 3.3 millivolts per liter, and the action on the A1C is similar as to most other drugs, 1 to 1.5%. The next class of medications that came into place maybe about five or six years ago are drugs that are called incretin therapies. And they're based on that we have an incretin hormone that is released in response to food in our intestines. It's called GLP-1 or glucagon-like peptide 1. When it's produced, though, in response to eating, it's very quickly gotten rid of. And it has multiple actions to control the blood sugar that I will talk about in just a minute. A reminder that people that have type 2 diabetes have less GLP-1 in their system than someone who does not have diabetes. And GLP-1, as I said, gotten rid of very quickly in the body in about two to eight minutes by an enzyme that's called DPP4, and you'll see why that's important in just a minute. So DPP4 inhibitors, that is a class of medication, actually prolong the action of the natural GLP-1 that you already have in your system. And then there's GLP injectable analog drugs that add more GLP-1 to your system to work. And so what does GLP-1 do for you? So GLP-1, when it's released in the intestines there, it helps your pancreas to release insulin based on what your blood sugar level is. It also slows the release of that other hormone I told you came out of the pancreas called glucagon. Again, it's very dependent on what the blood sugars are. So kind of a little bit of a smart action. It won't make you go low because it knows where your blood sugar is. It also slows the amount, the time your stomach empties, and so it can change the rate of the rise of blood sugar. It helps you to return to being able to feel full. A lot of people with type 2 diabetes, because they have less GLP-1, really don't need no when they're full, and they tend to overeat. And this helps to return that action to them. GLP-1 is also thought to help our beta cells stay in proof function, but they've only proved that with rat models and not with human beings yet. So the first class of those that came up to Canada were called the DPP-4 inhibitors. So they inhibited the deactivation of GLP-1 inside the body. So the names of them were citiglit or are citagliptin, Genuvia. The dose is 25 to 100 milligrams once a day. Saxagliptin, known as Onglyza, 2.5 to 5 milligrams once a day. Linagliptin, other name is Tragenta, is 5 milligrams once a day. These three medications are also available already combined with metformin. And here's a little tip for you. If you take one of these, Genuvia, Onglyza, or Trigenta, and you also take metformin, 
it's probably cheaper to get the combined medication, to take it twice a day, rather than to get the two separately. The side effects of this medication, most people don't notice anything. But there are some possible side effects listed, such as upper respiratory tract infection, getting a stuffy nose. And unfortunately, there is no effect on weight. It doesn't make you gain weight, but it doesn't make you lose weight either. It reduces the after-meal blood sugar by about 2.7 millimoles per liter, and it reduces your A1C anywhere from 0.8 to 1%. The other class of those incretin therapies are known as GLP-1 analogs. So the two that are available in Canada, Exenatide or Biata, these are both injectables, by the way. It's 5 to 10 milligram injected twice a day with meals. And the other one is called liraglutide or Victoza. And the dose of that is anywhere from 0 0.6 to 1.8 milligrams daily in the morning. Both of these are available in pens that are by the unit dose. And they're very, very easy to use. So these medications, as I mentioned, they're injectable. They're usually added on to sulfonylureas or metformin or onto both. And I actually have seen people that are put on one of these just by itself at the beginning because it does seem to work on many different aspects of why our blood sugar goes high. The GLP-1 analogs are very resistant. They're not going to be broken down by that DPP-4 enzyme. So you have a much higher level and it stays around for a much longer piece of time. The side effects that can happen, the most common side effect is the nausea. So Vieta tends to cause a little bit more nausea than does Victoza, and Victoza's nausea tends to be more related to the dose that the person is on, and it tends to diminish over a couple of weeks. If any of you are on either of these medications and still experiencing a lot of nausea, one of the recommendations is to have smaller, more frequent meals to help eliminate that vomiting, the nausea. They also can cause vomiting, diarrhea, and although by themselves they don't cause low blood sugars, when it's used in combination with a sulfonylurea, uh, it has the potential to cause a low blood sugar. And Victoza now has an indication to be used with a long-acting insulin called Lantus or another one called Levomir, and that might increase the risk of having a low blood sugar as well. Their drugs have been known to cause weight loss. On average, it's 1.9 kilograms, so somewhere around the 5-pound uh, rate. But there have been people who have said that they get significant and maintained weight loss somewhere in the line of 20 to 40 pounds but it is very individualized. I've had people that have lost no weight and people that have lost the 20 or 30 pounds. It does reduce the after-meal blood sugars by 2.7 to 4.5 millimoles, and it reduces the A1C from anywhere from 1 to 2%. That brings us to our newest class of medications that affect the kidney, because they have found that the kidney plays a very important role in glucose control. They always knew that, but now they have a medication that works on it. So what do your kidneys do? Is the blood goes into the kidney, and the kidney will filter the sugar. So in someone that doesn't have diabetes, that's about 180 grams, call it six ounces if you want, of glucose or sugar per day is filtered. Because the kidney has these little receptor cells in it, SGLT2 receptors, they resorb back into the blood 90% of the glucose. And then another set of receptors called GLT1 receptors, they absorb the other 10%. So that essentially no glucose goes out in the urine and only water is excreted if you do not have diabetes. When you have diabetes, it does get to be uh, more gets kept, by the way. But so we have these drugs called SGLT2 inhibitors. And that very fancy name is sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitors. So now you know why everybody just calls them SGLT2 inhibitors. So the, it inhibits the kidney reabsorbing glucose and also some sodium. And it does, unfortunately, make you maintain a little bit more potassium. So about 300 calories of sugar are excreted in the urine. If you're you losing 300 calories per day of sugar, you know there's probably going to be some weight loss involved with this medication. And again, 
On average, it's probably about four to five pounds, but I've also heard of people losing greater amounts. The names of these medications are canagliflozin or Invocana, 100 to 300 milligrams once a day. Most common dose is that 300. Dapagliflozin or Forziva, 5 to 10 milligrams once a day. Empagliflozin or Jardiance, 10 to 15 milligrams per day. These can be used by themselves to treat uh, the diabetes, or often we're seeing used in combination with metformin or a sulfonylurea or with an insulin product. And when they're used in combination with sulfonylureas and insulin, usually the dose of the insulin and the sulfonylurea ends up being reduced. And it can lower the A1C. There's been studies that say up to 3%, a little bit higher than most medications because they're not dependent on insulin. It's been an important addition to our range of medications that we can use to treat diabetes. Before I go on to the uh, side effects of this medication, I will tell you there have been recent studies on one of these medications that there is, has been a very positive effect on cardiovascular outcome disease. And so that's something that's going to be looked at quite a bit in the near future. So what happens with the side effects of this medication is that you have a lot of increase in urination, a larger amount of peeing, more frequent peeing. It can cause dizziness, especially if the fluid volume goes down and you're not drinking enough. Because it's getting rid of fluid, it can cause constipation and thirst. Dehydration is a big thing you need to be concerned about and to avoid by drinking lots of liquids. There's a higher risk for people getting dehydrated if they're over 65, if they take blood pressure medications, including diuretic drugs, or if they're on a very low sodium diet or they already have kidney problems. Medication most commonly causes either a urinary tract or a genital yeast infection. And so one of the good things about that is they found that if this occurs, either one, usually getting it treated once that first time that it happens, they don't reoccur. There are, of course, some people that do have recurrent yeast infections or recurrent urinary tract infections, and that might be a reason why the medication would be stopped in those individuals. It also retains a bit more potassium, so an increase in blood potassium is a concern that has to be looked at. Kidney problems need to be looked at, and there is an increase in low blood sugars when it's combined with things like sulfonylurea drugs and insulin. There is a rare side effect with this medication called diabetic ketoacidosis, which just means acid in the blood, and it's very uncommon normally in people with type 2 diabetes. It's more a, a, a condition that occurs in a type 1 when their blood sugars are higher than 14. But one of the challenges that has happened with this medication is that that acid in the blood has occurred at less than a 14 blood sugar. So I'm going to tell you in a minute about the in signs of DKA that you needed to be watching for. So the SGLG inhibitors, again, if you're sick, this is just this class of medication has just been added to that CDA sick list medications that's one of the resources at the bottom. So if you're vomiting, have diarrhea, unable to drink, essentially getting dehydrated, SGLT2s are another class of drug that you should stop until you're feeling better. And you should check your blood sugar more often to see what's happening. Very important to call your doctor if you do have signs of that rare DKA of the nausea, vomiting, a lack of appetite, having abdominal pain, excessive thirst, difficulty breathing because your body is trying to get rid of some of that acid or neutralize the acid in the blood, higher or normal amounts of confusion, unusual fatigue, or sleepiness, and make sure that you do stay really rehydrated when you're on this class of medications. So from going with these orals and the injectable non-insulin products, we're going to talk about insulin. So insulin, it is a normal product. This is basically a uh, the dark blue line there is what happens normally when you eat. When you eat, your body will release a large amount of insulin right away, looks after that high and brings it down in each meal. And there's also a small amount of insulin that occurs along the bottom. So ideally, you'd like to have an insulin that works in a similar way. 
So we have some bolus insulins, the rapid-acting analogs, do work like that. Bolus meaning mealtime, and I'm going to tell you what insulin's names are in just a minute. And we have basal insulins that look after that, that we need that insulin all the time. So we're going to have both, and we're going to just go on and show you. So what happens in type 2, you know, we have that normal, nobody has diabetes, that's what happened, I just explained it. And because that happens really rapidly after you eat a meal and it goes down, it keeps your blood sugar pretty much normal all the time. But in type 2 diabetes, unfortunately the insulin is not released like that. It's released like much slower, it's delayed, it doesn't go as high. And because of that, because now the person has less insulin, and they lose that, what they used to call first phase insulin release, that high peak, the blood sugars get high and stay high. So when can insulin be used? Insulin can be used at diagnosis. And the reason for that, too, is that the quicker you get your blood sugar under control, the better it is for your beta cells and for your control in general because having high blood sugar destroys more of those little cells that helps produce insulin. It can be used when oral medication or the injectable GLP-1s are no longer controlling the blood sugar and sometimes in combination with some of these medications depending on what insulin that you're on. If you're on just a long-acting once-a-day insulin, you're usually left on your oral medications. And as I mentioned a minute ago, Levimir and Lantus are used with Victoza. It can be used when you're sick and in hospital. And in fact, it can be used at any time that you want better control. One of the attachments, the resources at the bottom, is this type of insulin chart or something very similar to this. So what kind of insulins do we have? We have the bolus. That means meal time or prandial insulin. So we have rapid-acting ones. We have Humalog, Apidra, Nova Rapid, start to work in 10 to 15 minutes, peak within an hour to an hour and a half, short duration gone basically by the end of four hours. We have the short-acting, the older insulins, the human insulins called R insulin or Toronto insulin, take at least 30 minutes to start working, peak for about two to three hours, and last up to six and a half hours. The basal insulins, there's an intermediate kind, which is, everyone knows as N or NPH, takes one to three hours to work, five to eight hour peak and up to 18 hours action, often taken twice a day. And the long-acting newer insulins, the analogs, so they take Levimir is Dedimir, and Lantus is Glargine, takes up to 90 minutes to start working. Not really a peak, although Levimir has a slight one. The Levimir up to 24 hours action, 16 to 24 hours, and the Glargine has a 24-hour action. A new insulin that's available, which is called Tejail, is a, is a Lantus insulin, but it's more concentrated. It's U300. The very first time it started, it takes up to six hours to work, but it has up to a 30-hour action, and taking it daily, you don't need to worry about how long it takes to work because it's always going to be in your system. There's also insulins that are combined together, so there are a combination of those R and N. The first number, like 3070, means 30% 30 of it is R, 70% of it is N. The action times depends on just what we've said in that chart before. And now we have modern, more modern insulins that are analog. And although we use the term premix, it just means 30% of it, or the first number, is the amount that's going to work right away. And the second part of it has had something added to make it have a longer action to cover the background. So the uh, actions of these medications have a little bit of a chart. The gray is your natural. So there's Umulin N. It's covering the background. As you can see, there's a flat gray line for natural, but Umulin N has a greater risk of causing low blood sugars. There's Levimir and Lantus, which is closer. There is R insulin, which is a meal time, and as you can see, it doesn't match the normal physiologic, and where you see those great areas of white or a much greater chance of having a low blood sugar, compare that to the rapid-acting insulin analog, Fumalog, Nova Rapid, and Epidra, which more closely match it and will control your after-meal blood sugar much better. There's also those premixes I told you about, so R and Ns. Again, not ideal. Those big white patches you see under the red line is a greater risk of low blood sugars. They don't match the, the normal secretion of insulin. 
in the body compare that to those newer ones which are going to have less chance of hypoglycemia and better insulin control. We also have a couple of new insulins that are going to see. They're more concentrated. They have a smaller volume. Just out within the last month or so is Tujeo, which is Lantus or Glargine insulin, but in 300 units per mil instead of 100. And it lasts, again, up to that 30 hours, but it reaches a steady state. So if you miss by a couple of hours when you're taking it, it's not going to make as big a difference. It is a true once a day. It does not need to be taken more than once a day. And there is, within the middle of this month, a U200 Umalog, which is that mealtime insulin. It's due to be available in mid-October. With both of these insulins, the pens that they're available in, if you took 80 units of Glargine and U100, you would still take 80 units in the new Tejo. It's just that it's a smaller volume. The same will be the case with the Umalog insulin. The pens will be in the same number of units. This as an example of volume because that's the main difference. Although Tejo, they have found, has less incidence of hypoglycemia of by about 25% than Lantus did, which already had a low incidence, it's a smaller volume. So the blue dot there is what, say, 10 units of Lantus would be. And if you can see that very small gray dot below this green tip pen, that's the same amount of insulin but in a more concentrated form. It will still be injected the same way, but a smaller volume will hurt less as well. And it will give you a true once-a-day action with hardly any peak, so much less chance of having a low blood sugar, which is already low. So bedtime insulin is the commonest one that is used first as prescribed, and some people will never need to have another insulin other than once they get their fasting blood sugars correct by increasing their dose. The green line is my representation of NPH. So you can see it's much higher than the natural secretion, greater chance of having a low blood sugar. The uh, purpley line here is my representation of Lantus, pretty flat line. Detmir has a slight peak, but it's not a big difference. And the newer one is even going to be flatter than it was before. So it's going to be a very long-acting insulin. So the... Um, analog insulins that are available more closely mimic what happens in the body and also cause less low blood sugar. So the mealtime ones are the Humalog, Nova Rapid, Epidra, the once-a-day long-acting type are the Lantus, Tegeo, and Levimir. And because they normally mimic it better, it's a lower rate of hypoglycemia. And the targets for blood sugar control are the same as we've already talked about. Often once you've had a long-acting insulin and you've got your morning blood sugar controlled less than seven, then you might find that well, if your blood sugars are still high, they might add one or more uh, incidences of a rapid-acting insulin to help control your blood sugar. And so, for instance, one might do it. Maybe you have to take two doses in a day. And some people do take multiple daily injections of insulin. Remember, it frees you up. It gives you much more selection and when you can eat. So Eumelin insulin, it doesn't mimic it. Normal physiologic insulin has a much higher rate. Those are your R insulins. Anything that has R in it, it has to be injected at least 30 minutes prior to a meal. So it's working when your blood sugar is going up. Intermediate action, anything with an end, make sure it's properly resuspended by rocking and rolling it back and forth 10 times. Never, ever shake it. Premixes such as the 3070s, or that I've already talked about, again, you have to make sure it's properly mixed and injected 30 minutes before the meal. This is just an example of an R insulin with an N, and you can see those big spaces where that natural secretion isn't over care, those are the areas that you more likely will have a low blood sugar. Premixed insulins that are available that are analogs are Humalog Mix 25, Humalog Mix 50, and Novo Mix 30. They do more closely mimic what happens naturally. Again, must be properly rock and roll 10 times each and not shaken, but they're only injected 5 to 15 minutes before the meal. If you find you can't remember that 30 minutes, ask your doctor about changing to a premixed analog insulin. This is an example of Novo Mix. 30 and its action. And some people might need a very small dose for lunch to cover that. 
So when you're injecting insulin, the side effects, of course, are a low blood sugar. That's a risk. You have to work on preventing it. It's usually caused by missing a meal, more physical activity than normal, or excess insulin given. Prevention is knowing those onsets, the peaks, the duration, and planning your activity and following your meal plans. And if you're going to have extra activity, make sure you have some extra carbohydrates. Always have your treatment for low blood sugar with you at all times. Monitor it before, during exercise, and before driving. Never drive if your blood sugar is less than 5. Weight gain can be an issue, but that can be dealt with with healthy planning of meals and exercise. The drugs themselves, usually about 3 to 5 pounds, so it is related to what you're eating as well. When you're using the insulin, remember that once you start using it, it's good for 28 days out of the fridge. Putting it back in the fridge, it doesn't make it last longer. It just hurts more. Levimir and Tejo are 42 days. Cloudy insulin, you have to resuspend. Make sure you inject by rotating your sites and always use a new needle because it's going to be less pain. There's not going to be any blockage. You're not going to have uh, your insulin having a breakdown with air getting in. You never need to use a needle longer than six. Four is good for everybody. Straight in, count to 10 seconds before you remove it. And you need made to make sure that you are properly rotating your sights. Abdomen is the fastest place. Avoid the two inches around your belly button. And pick one of those quarters, one, two, three, or four. Use each quarter for one week, separating all injections within that one quarter by a fingerful. And that way you allow the other three areas three weeks to heal. Just a little bit about hypoglycemia because I'm running a little bit behind here. Hypoglycemia is when your blood sugar is less than four. Uh, and you, any of these symptoms could occur. Attached to this is also a, a thing about treating lows and high blood sugars from the CDA to look into this more. One person could have one reaction. The other one might have something totally different. But you also need to know how to treat it properly. If your blood sugar is 3.9 to 2.8, it has to be treated with 15 grams of carbohydrate. And it needs to be a fast-acting carbohydrate. Honestly, chocolate might taste good, but it's pretty high fat, and it's not going to bring your blood sugar up quickly enough. You want to treat it with dextrose tablets. There's a product called Dex4. Easy to remember. Take four Dex4 when you're less than four. But any dextrose tablet will be fine as long as you get enough to make 15 grams. Three quarters of a cup of juice or pop, three teaspoons or a tablespoon of honey or sugar, six lifesavers. But always remember to retest your blood in 15 minutes to make sure you've come up. And if your next meal is more than an hour away, eat 15 grams of carbohydrate with a protein source, such as half a cheese sandwich or perhaps a slice of whole grain bread with some peanut butter. If your blood sugar is less than 2.8 and you're still awake, then it's important to take 20 grams of fast-acting carbs, such as 5 dex 4 or 1 cup of juice or pop or 4 teaspoons of honey or sugar or 8 lifesavers. Same applies. Retest in 15 minutes, make sure your blood sugars come up, and if it hasn't, retreat. And if your meal is more than an hour away, have that protein source. And if you're having problems, check your blood sugar more frequently until it's stable. So we do have a question for you. Sorry this last bit was a bit rushed, but on a scale of 1 to 5, after listening to this webinar, how much better do you feel you understand your medications? Please select, and I'll give you about five to six seconds, and then I'll get the results for us. So very good. So more than 75% of you did learn a lot from this presentation. I am very glad. The next polling question we have is after learning about these options that we've talked about and about control, would you be going to see your doctor to can talk about better control of your diabetes? Please select yes or no. Wow, very good. So two-thirds of you have learned something. They may want to talk about improving your blood sugar control. It will make you feel better in the long run. And now back to Farah. 
Thank you so much, Elaine. Um, I know it's it's really difficult uh, to condense some uh, very important information in a short 45-minute uh, time span. So I just want to say you did a fabulous job. Um, so thank you very much for providing us with all of that great information. Um, to keep um, in mind of the time, we just have about 10 minutes left, so I want to get our question and answer period started right away. Um, so with that being said, uh, Elaine, I'll start with our first question. Um, one of our participants has asked, why are the ranges on the A1C readings so narrow with lab work, 90 days for three-month testing? That's because an A1C measures how much sugar is stuck to a hemoglobin inside your red blood cell, and a red blood cell only lives in your body for 90 days, 90 to 120 days. Great, thanks for that. I'll move on to our next question. One of our participants is a type 1 diabetic, and they're asking if metformin can be used for type 1. I have seen it used in type 1, but it's not as commonly used. Uh, more it's usually used in a type 1 that is also having a bit of insulin resistance, maybe a little overweight, but it is primarily a drug for type 2. There's no reason why Great. it couldn't be used. <laughs> Thanks for that, Elaine. I'll move on to our next question. One of our participants has asked, I'm wondering about the new drug in Volcana and the fact that there have been warnings from the FDA, such as the risk of bone disease and ketoacidosis. The major challenge with that and has been the idea of the ketoacidosis. There is not, it's the uh, bone disease is extremely rare. The biggest risk is rare as well, that diabetic ketoacidosis, it is a warning with the medication and it should be explained to people. It is important to stay re fully hydrated. As I talked about on that slide about the DKA, looking for those warning symptoms and stopping the medication or checking with your doctor at that time. It's reversible. Thanks, Elaine. Uh, one of our other participants has asked about the uh, medication Tegeo and if it's um, allowed to be used in children. At this point in time, it's 18 years and up because they have not, not done any studies in children. And you have to think about why have they have even brought it out. You're not going to see a child on a very high dose of Lantus. It has really been brought out in this U300 concentration because there is a lot of people that are using large number of units. Unfortunately, the pen currently only goes to 80 units, um, but perhaps they, will be, they are working on a pen that will be able to inject more. It would be extremely unlikely that a child would ever need to have uh, that large number of units. You'll have to wait and see what happens with the studies before they recommend it in children. Thanks, Elaine. Before I jump to the next question, um, as Elaine had mentioned earlier, I'd just like to reiterate, at the bottom of your screen there, there should be a section called Resource List. So all of the medications that Elaine has spoke to today um, will be on there. So please download those resources at your earliest convenience um, before the webinar comes to an end. Um, with that being said, our next question our participant has asked, you mentioned metformin at breakfast, lunch, and supper. If you tolerate metformin well, what are your thoughts about taking metformin at bedtime to help lower fasting morning blood sugars? It doesn't matter what time of day that you take metformin, it's still a major action is on your fasting blood sugar. However, if you want to take it at bedtime, take it with some food. The main reason it's taken with meals is because it causes the upset stomach. And if you really want to take it just once a day, then talk to your doctor about the blue metza, which is taken just once a day at bedtime. Its main action is going to be overnight because there's no food in the middle. When you have no food, your liver wants to pump out more sugar because there's nothing there. Occasionally, if you have a higher blood sugar in the morning than when you go to bed, and I do want to say occasionally, taking a snack at bedtime to keep your blood sugar a little bit more even, even though you're on metformin, might make it lower in the morning. Great. Thanks, Elaine. Um, our next question our participant has asked, if a diabetic has too low of a blood sugar, are they, sorry, I'm just reading here, are they given a sugar source or should they rather be given a sugar source to increase their blood sugar? Should this be followed with a protein? So I did already address that. So when your blood sugar is lower than four, you need to have a rapid acting sugar source. So dextrose is the best. 
and you shouldn't give protein then because you want to bring the blood sugar up. You give carbohydrate with a protein after the blood sugar has risen above four to keep your blood sugar up longer, but you do not give protein to treat it, and you don't give fats to treat it. That's why chocolate is not a good choice. You need to get that blood sugar up quickly. The best way is with dextrose, juice, honey that I've given you the list of, and it's also on that resource on highs and lows. Great. Thanks, Elaine. Another participant has asked, is Lantus better taken at night? A lot of people take Lantus in the morning because they remember it. <laughs> and maybe that is more important than doing it at night. The reason that Lantus is initiated at nighttime is because you're wanting to see what your blood sugar is in the morning. So there's no food in between. Whereas if you take Lantus in the morning, there's a lot of food happening in the middle if you're measuring your blood sugar at bedtime. But once you've gotten your dose up or even take it in the morning, you've gotten your morning blood sugar, then you can take it in the morning. 2JO, by the way, I don't think I mentioned, is recommended to be taken in the morning once a day. Great. Thanks, Elaine. Um, our next participant has asked, can you take a DPP-4 with an SGLT-2? At this point in time, I don't think it's actually on the recommendation, but there's no reason. And you know that recommendations are based on studies, that if something has already happened. So I don't see any reason why it would pose a problem, but I don't truly know because they don't have that as a recommendation. I mean, I do see people taking DPP-4 inhibitors along with like the Victoza and the Baeta, that does not really make sense to me because Victoza and Baeta are resistant to breakdown by DPP-4. Great. Thanks, Elaine. Another participant has asked, are there plans to have insulin pumps, pumps Sorry, use the higher concentration insulins for type 2 diabetics? Not at this point in time at all. And any insulin that would be recommended for a pump has to be approved for use in pump. And if you guys understand pumps, they only use rapid-acting insulin. So they only use uh, a Pedra, Novo Rapid, or Humalog, because the pump will put out a little teeny bit all the time to control that background, and then it is given in a dose to control your uh, meal time, so it's injected when you need meal time based on the amount of carbohydrates that you're eating. Uh, people that are on a pump tend to end up using a lot lower insulin, and people that have type 2 diabetes and requiring more uh, less often use a pump, and the pump manufacturers themselves would have to be probably changing a lot of things in order to make their programs work correctly. But at this time, to my knowledge, there's no plans to do that. Great. Thanks, Elaine. And just a last, um, hopefully short question here. Um, and just so everyone remembers, if we do not get to your questions today, please email us directly at webinars at diabetes.ca and we'll be happy to follow up with you directly. Um, but our last question here, Elaine, is um, a participant is looking to know what class of medication does Genuvia fall under? So Genuvia Cytoglyptin, and it is a DPP-4 inhibitor. Great. Thanks again, Elaine, and thanks so much for um, all of you that have participated today. Um, it's It's been uh, a lot of great information and great learning, obviously compacted in a short amount of time, and uh, Elaine, you've done a fabulous job. I do want to say a quick thank you to our sponsors, Bayer and Merck, um, whose support have helped us make these webinars possible. Uh, we do hope that you will participate in our final fall webinar that's coming up next week on diabetes complications presented by Dr. Jeremy Gilbert. You can visit our website and register at diabetes.ca slash webinars. For any other diabetes-related information or questions, please call our 1-800 number. It's 1-800-BANTING or visit our website at diabetes.ca. We have a ton of different programs and services um, either available online, over the phone, or in person. Um, so do call us to find out more or visit our website. So once again, I just want to thank all of you for participating today and thank our speaker, Elaine, for a fabulous job. And we look forward to your participation in our webinars in the future. Have a great day. Thank you.